So my topic is Earth's initial condition. However, I decided in the last day or so that rather than tell you a story, um, I will instead talk about the various processes that we need to understand and their associated time scales and energies and so forth. And in particular, some interesting questions about mixing, about unmixing, that is differentiation, and about equilibration. And so what I've listed here is six questions, and those are going to be the focus of my presentation. And you will see that there's quite a bit of overlap between these questions that I pose and things that you've already heard from uh, Sarah Stewart and from Dave Ruby. And the first of the questions is, why is the Earth probably completely molten after a giant impact? I'm assuming that giant impacts are part of the process of Earth formation. And I will say a bit about why that nonetheless may not necessarily mean that you have good mixing. And by mixing in this context, I really mean, for example, isotopes. Would it be the case that after the giant impact, you would have uniformity of oxygen isotopes as an example? And if, I'll make a few comments about the state of art with impact simulations. I thought I would say a few words. This is a smaller topic, but an important one. And uh, people ask me about this sometimes. Can impacts inject volatiles? And I'm going to argue that they can, that you can have a net gain. So if you bring in an icy, a large icy body and hit the earth, you should not think that because ice is more volatile that that gets blasted off. That's not a correct way to think about it. You can actually inject the volatiles. I'll talk a bit about equilibration during core formation and core addition events that occur in giant impacts. And this is of relevance both for the extent to which siderophiles in the mantle will actually equilibrate with the core forming material. And of course, to the hafnium tungsten chronology uh, that Rick Carlson talked about. I'll talk a bit about magma oceans. Can magma oceans lead to a differentiated state where you separate the solids from the liquid? That's a non-trivial issue. A lot of people in my opinion, do not think about this correctly. Uh, say a bit about a basal magma ocean and the time scales associated with magma oceans. Uh, why might mixing be easier in solids than in liquids? This one deserves a quest a, uh, an exclamation mark as well as a question mark because it's counterintuitive, but I'm going to try and persuade you that in some cases, solids are a better way to mix things than liquids. And part of this is relevant to the preservation of a basal magma ocean and a giant impact. And I'll end up with a few comments about why some things are so poorly understood. This is almost philosophical, but of course it's a, uh, an issue of great importance to uh, students. You know, what is your future career? Do you have things to understand? You have a hell of a lot of things to understand. <laughs> So you've already seen uh, simulations of this sort. Rick Carlson uh, showed an example very similar to this. Uh, and Sarah showed some other examples. This happens to be one that I'm doing with Miki Nakajima, which is, uh, who is a, a student at Caltech. But actually, this was a test case very similar to some that Robin Canup uh, did quite some uh, years ago. So these are SPH simulations. And the color coding here is entropy, entropy increase, starts out with uniform entropy. So you saw before the impact that everything was blue, meaning low entropy. And then the entropy uh, increases as the impact takes place. Notice that in this particular simulation, um, it's not a single impact, so to speak. There are, uh, uh, so there's the first impact. It comes in again, hits again now, of course, this won't happen every time. The details will vary from time to time. The iron arrives then. Stuff gets spread out into a disk from which perhaps the moon forms. And you'll notice this heterogeneity in the entropy distribution. It's not completely obvious in this picture, but I'll show you cross sections in a moment. Uh, red is high entropy. Blue is low entropy. And from this, of course, uh, 
comes a, uh, our ability to find what the entropy is in the end state. The entropy increase comes about through the shocks. When you add vector material, entropy is roughly conserved. There's not enough time in 24 hours to radiate away significant energy. So here you see the material that ends up in the disk. Each one of these points is an SPH particle. Over here, a very dense set of particles in the uh, mantle of the Earth. I don't show the core in this case. The core, of course, is different composition. All this stuff in this uh, calculation is assumed to start out as Forsterite, which, of course, is not right, but uh, not, not an unreasonable uh, choice as a starting calculation. And you'll notice, actually, that the disk is rather constant in entropy. Now, entropy is a very important parameter to think about because, of course, if I tell you temperature and pressure, that's not enough to tell you the state of the material. So if I, if I give you a bit of stuff and I say the temperature is such and so, the pressure is such and so, if I'm down at low pressures, you don't know whether I'm talking about a liquid or a gas. Uh, but they are very different entropy states. So entropy translates, uh, especially at low pressure, into a more precise statement about the state of the material. So the disk is actually 10 to 20 percent vapor uh, because of these very high entropies. And of course, the highest entropy of all occurs in the outer region, as you might expect, because that's the part that's most heavily shocked. Now here's uh, a very important point which I, I want to dwell on a little bit, and that is the entropy distribution within Earth itself after the giant impact. So now the scale is different. The core is over to the left, not shown. Uh, and here's the uh, mantle part of the Earth. The Earth is puffed up a bit, so it's a bit larger than uh, one on the scale because of uh, thermal expansion. And you can see here uh, that one has, uh, now of course the units depend on the composition. This is Forsterite, but the entropy here, the, the SI unit is joules per, kil, uh, per kilogram per degree Kelvin. Uh, and in this particular calculation, it starts out isentropic. It's a bit more than 2,500 in those units. And it gains about 1,000 in these units, uh, even in the deep mantle. So even the deep mantle, uh, the shock wave propagates through. It does so heterogeneously, so the reason why there's a spread, this is a real spread, this is a heterogeneity. So if you add any particular radius in the Earth, like 0.7 Earth radii, you're going to have material of this entropy as well as material of that entropy. Uh, so this is a real spread, a heterogeneity in the, the final thermal state. And uh, so let me say a bit about the entropy increase, and then I'll say a bit about the entropy gradient. Dave, you're plotting nothing to the left because the core is not in The core, of course, I can't use the same units because it's a different composition, but I've left the core out of the calculation. The core is uh, quite substantially shocked, although uh, typically uh, if one thinks of it, if, if one renormalizes, remember this is per kilogram, so I can't use the same units. But if, if, if I think of it in terms of temperature, um, it, it does have similar temperatures to this. If you insist on me telling you about temperatures, this, of course, is, is like uh, 8,000 Kelvin, something like that. So they're separate. Uh, in SPH calculations, there's actually a little bit of a bit of a problem if I've got an SPH particle that is silicate that is right next to an iron particle, and we're struggling actually a little bit with with that issue because because in order to correctly characterize the thermodynamic state, the SPH particle in question has to be surrounded by other particles of the same kind. So there are some technical issues there. I don't want to get sidetracked into those technical issues. But there are, there, are, uh, there are actually quite a number of problems with correct interpretation of SPH results. So coming back to this question that I pose, why is the Earth probably completely molten after a giant impact? Uh, this is a non-trivial point. And as Sarah mentioned yesterday, uh, there was a view at one point, in fact, from Tonks and Malash. I well remember it because I argued with them at the time. I was a referee of their paper. There was the point at that time, you know, do you really melt the material? 
And, and there were actually two issues. One was the equation of state, uh, and, and the other was uh, what did you assume about the body before the giant impact? It really matters. And uh, my argument is that the pre-impact state of the Earth is surely near the solidus. Why? The pre-impact state, that is the state of the Earth before the giant impact, has suffered many previous impacts. And that energy was deposited at depth. And to be sure, if it's completely molten at some earlier stage, it can cool off and partly crystallize. And I will talk a little bit more about that in due course. But it's difficult on this time scale of tens of millions of years, and with the enormous amount of energy that's delivered, remember what I told you on Monday, 10 times greater than all radioactive heat integrated over geologic time. It's a huge gravitational energy put, input. It's very difficult to cool the planet efficiently below the solidus, given the enormous amount of energy delivered and the time scale. So I know of no way to cool the body in those circumstances significantly below the solidus. And therefore, I argue that the real issue for whether you have melt or not is whether you exceed the latent heat, uh, that is to say the entropy increase associated with melting. The giant impact calculations I just showed typically indicate an entropy increase in the deep mantle that is about twice the entropy of fusion. And this is another instance, by the way, where talking about entropies is much more useful than talking about temperatures, uh, because this is a number that's actually not that sensitive to pressure. Uh, it is, after all, just a statement about going from an ordered state to a disordered state. And uh, it doesn't vary enormously with uh, materials if you, if you characterize it per mole. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, this number is not likely to be wrong by a large amount. It is nonetheless true, in our calculations at least, that a small amount may escape melting. And of course, remember, I just showed you one example. Uh, and who knows exactly what the giant impact was like. And Sarah talked about alternative scenarios, although the ones she talked about might actually possibly uh, produce even uh, a stronger statement, but I'm not sure about that because we haven't done them. Uh, there may be, and, and we find, uh, that in this heterogeneous mix of materials of different entropy, that there are nuggets, cold nuggets. That's possible. Uh, that's a little bit like uh, something that I sometimes see people doing, and that is they take their cup of hot coffee and they put an ice cube in and they stir it, right? Uh, and, and the stirring I assure you, will happen. Uh, but, but there is a quantitative question there about how quickly the ice cube will completely melt in my coffee cup when I stir it. Uh, and, and so there may be nuggets that survive, but, but I think to a first approximation, uh, complete melting is, is very likely. It's, it's from the irreversible entropy production due to the passage of the shock wave. Okay, so, uh, so it is kinetic energy in the sense of the flow of material associated with the shock wave, but it's not kinetic energy in the sense of uh, turbulent convection going into why viscous would heating. Be, uh, uh, why would it be kinetic energy? You said you chose fourth right, but it doesn't matter. Why, if that's the case, why would composition matter? Maybe it doesn't. I don't actually know the answer to your question. I suspect to a first approximation it doesn't matter a lot. It matters somewhat because the equation of state matters. If I've got a highly compressible material, then there's more entropy production. So uh, I think in, in, the, in the broadest sense, composition actually matters quite a lot. Uh, I can assure you, for example, that when you shock hydrogen, you get extremely high temperatures for the same pressure because it's very compressible. Now, of course, we're not talking about hydrogen here. We're talking about entropy, not temperature. But if that's the case, why would you not care about it? I think I know what you asking. Yeah, all right. So the entropy of melting. 
Oh, it's oh. similar for all materials. Yeah. He's talking about the entropy gain from the shock yes. as well. We don't yes. Shock is now. material dependent yes. because of the yes. compressibility yes. of the yes. material. Yes. So the one is material independent, the other is material dependent. Right. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> And, and, and by the way, liquid silicates are very compressible compared to the solids, and that actually matters, and I'll come back to that. How yeah. close do you have to be to the solid to begin with? To so so that, that comes into the question of how much entropy I need to get from a little bit below the solidus to the solidus, and that's small. But once you get to, say, 500 Kelvin difference, uh, or 1,000 Kelvin, then it starts to be important. So... Uh, Maybe I should be slightly more quantitative, but I, I should say, though, um, and, and this is a general point of importance, that the entropy of melting is small compared to the total entropy change in I, if I go from room temperature to the melting point. Okay? So, so uh, this does matter. If, if the, so let me turn it around and make a different statement. If for some reason the earth was cold before the impact, it will not completely melt. By cold, I mean, you know, 1,000 Kelvin uh, throughout, which, of course, is very cold at, at, at high pressures. One last thing about the initial temperature of the reactors. Would they be influenced by how much sort of unpleasant gas they were? Yeah, if you, if you had a projectile that did its differentiation because of aluminum-26, some of that energy would be preserved. Of course, for mass-sized projectiles, you don't actually have to rely on aluminum-26. Gravitational energy of formation, if you make something the size of Mars, is enough to make it hot. I just meant volumetrically heat, like uh, something closer to a solidus rather than I would expect a mass-sized projectile to also have its mantle close to the solid. Now, if you go down to the moon, it starts to get a little bit less clear. Of course, we can't, you can't make the moon by hitting the Earth with the moon. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, so there's a range of giant impacts, and so my statement doesn't, depends how you define a giant impact. If you, do, if you include things where a moon-sized body hits the Earth, then I'm not at all sure that this complete melting will take place. But, but for a Mars-sized projectile, I think it will. Sorry, the... Because of the short half-life, 26 aluminum... Yeah, I'm not talking about the moon formula. Oh, yeah, yeah no, no, this, this event is much later, but the aluminum-26 heating could have been important in preheating, so to speak, the projectile if that energy was preserved. And for a Mars-sized projectile, it may be. So, so aluminum-26 heating is not relevant at the epoch, but it's relevant for the, the previous... Period. Yeah. What, what percent of the system um, are these nuggets, and what, what are, what's their general length scale in this relation? Well, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the particle size, so to speak, in, in these SPH calculations is like 200 kilometers. So there comes a point where that's not a, a well defined question. Perhaps. Uh, when I talk about core formation, this issue will come back. I mean, what, what, you know, there's a limit to what you can do with SPH. But, um, but uh, some parts of the material do not get shocked a lot, and the variance, the variance in entropy at a given radius is actually quite large. So, but I, so I can't really answer your question. I think you're going beyond what SPH can tell us. Now, here's a very important point about the results of this calculation. Notice the trend in the mantle. And what it says is that the material at the base of the mantle is much, much less shocked than the material at the top. It's kind of obvious, actually. This is a stably stratified outcome. I'm assuming here that it's compositionally uniform. I don't know that, of course. But, but if, I, if I brought in a projectile that had a very similar composition to its mantle as uh, the proto-Earth, then this would be uniform in terms of bulk composition. 
it would be isotopically different uh, if the projectile is isotopically different. I suppose it was different in oxygen isotopes, for example, which is part of the motivation for this kind of work. And I can tell you also, although it's not shown in this particular diagram, that we, we follow the particles, and so we know that the projectile particles end up being in the outer region. There aren't many down here. Now, this is starting to get to the point where you wonder whether SPH is telling you the correct behavior, but uh, that is what happens. So if you actually did a profile of oxygen isotopes and you thought that the projectile was different from the target, you would also see a trend. Um, but the important point I want to make is, of course, that this is from the point of view of thermal convection, stably stratified. Remember that thermal convection operates in a low viscosity system, essentially on a constant entropy. Was there a question? Yeah. The surface immediately begins to cool off. Correct. Very good. So, so you're a good straight man. I was about to, I was about to make that point. So, on a time scale of hundreds to thousands of years. This entire line will go down like that, and so it will end up being a cross like so, which will be a completely molten state. Of course, in that time scale, we think the moon will form. So from the particular question of trying to understand isotopic heterogeneity between uh, Earth and moon, there is the doubt that the system will mix during the time that the moon formed. So this is of particular interest to something that people are struggling with right now, which is that the Earth and the moon are isotopically very similar in respect of oxygen and respect of uh, other isotopic uh, aspects as well. So this system doesn't necessarily mix well, if there were a layer at the base of the mantle, which may have been there as a basal magma ocean before the giant impact, it will not get mixed up as a consequence of the giant impact. So here again, plotted in a different way, are the averages for the entropy as a function of radius for different impact simulations that we've done. And one question that we posed for ourselves is whether this structure could be overturned quickly, that is to say literally on a time scale of days, because the Earth is differentially rotating. So here shown at eight hours into the simulation is the rotation state of the Earth. And of course, rigid body rotation would be a flat line because what's plotted here is uh, angular velocity of rotation to uh, the eventual uh, final state of the system conserving angular momentum. So this is an angular momentum conserving calculation leaving out the possibility that the disk could talk on the Earth, which it might, but this is, this is what we have. And uh, you might wonder, well, what's happening here? Why is it that at later times, rather quickly actually, in a day, the Earth ends up at its rigid body rotation? And that's a warning about the limitation of SPH, because this is a, uh, an artificial viscosity effect we may be able to suppress this effect, but in the current calculations, that's what's happening. We know by looking at what the fluid is doing that this is not coming about through macroscopic currents. So you can't see anything in the SPH that's actually showing a mixing. Therefore, it has to come from artificial viscosity. But it is possible, marginally possible, that this rotation state here, which has very strong excess angular velocity in the outer regions is sufficiently uh, strong that it satisfies the criterion for overturn. Now this thing here is the Richardson number. The Richardson number, when it's small, corresponds to the situation where the shear flow can overcome 
the gravitational stability of the system. I should say, by the way, that this entropy difference between top and bottom um, corresponds to a density difference of between 5 and 10 percent, actually more like 10 percent. So this is a large effect. Normally when we think about planets, we think about uh, thermal expansion as being a fairly small effect, but, but this is a very extreme situation in which thermal expansion is significant. Um, so the, uh, what you have to do, of course, is you, you mustn't compare absolute densities. The absolute density down here, of course, is much higher because of pressure, but you have to ask if I take that fluid element and displace it to lower pressure, will it be less or more dense than the surroundings? And in fact, it would be more dense by uh, of order 10%. So the question is whether this flow, which comes of course from the fact that the material that's arriving is coming in at high velocity and crashing into the surface, transferring angular momentum by shocks, to the adjacent material, but not transferring angular momentum to depth, at least not with the resolution that we have in the current calculations, whether that can overturn it. And it seems uh, uh, so far to be marginal. So we're not sure about the answer to that. But it is very likely that if you put an, in, a, an intrinsically more dense layer down here, then not only do you have to overcome that, you have to overcome the, the additional several percent, whatever it is, associated with a base or magma ocean. And I think that's very unlikely. So one of the things I find intriguing about this is that you're not going to stir up a base or magma ocean at this point or subsequently. And so a base or magma ocean can survive a giant impact. And this may be relevant to the Neodymium 142 story. Now, Rick talked about different alternative explanations. It's not clear that that's the correct explanation. But if you thought there was a differentiation event on the Earth that predated the giant impact that made the moon, the consequences of that differentiation event can, I think, survive through a giant impact. Yes. Yes. It, it doesn't appear to be enough, but you're quite right that we have not uh, looked at that aspect yet. But you're quite right that the core can help to reduce that density, that entropy contrast. Uh, probably, uh, well, I will get to core formation. There are additional issues with core formation. SPH does not properly describe core formation. So, you're making a valid point, but unfortunately, I can't answer that problem by looking just at the SPH calculations. What's certainly true is that core formation on the Earth for the entire core is enough to heat the system by 5,000 Kelvin. That's a lot. But of course, here we're just adding, you know, a Mars core mass worth, and so you're down at 500 Kelvin or whatever the number is. So it's, it's not overwhelming. It's not as if it's going to overwhelm my story, but it is an important correction. Now, it turns out that there's a, uh, a concern that we have to address and have not yet addressed. And that has to do with the realization in recent years that um, the thermodynamic properties of a completely molten Earth are really quite a lot different in terms of Grunice and Gamma, which is what matters. Also, of course, coefficient of thermal expansion and, and compressibility and so forth, which are interrelated through Maxwell's relations. The properties are significantly different from the solid. And here's an illustration of this. So Anios is the thing that we have been using. And what I'm telling you now is that it's not right. Whether that matters for some of the things I've just told you, we don't yet know. But this is a concern that if you take Lars Stixrud's, this is Lars Stixrud's result, 
and, and plot it up. So this is an isentrope that comes from his molecular dynamics work. Uh, you see that it is much steeper. This is, uh, I'm sorry, part of the scale is lost, but this is temperature uh, as a function of pressure and GPA. So this is extending through the mantle. Uh, this must be, I think, 3,000. Yeah. Um, and you can see that the isentrope is considerably steeper. Now, the, the history in this field is the following, that people used to think, oh, Grunice and Gamma, if anything, goes down uh, as the pressure goes up. Uh, people in shockwave work used to assume that. They used to assume even uh, that it goes inversely with density. But what Lars showed, and it's, it's supported by the shockwave work at Caltech in the, in the last several years, is that the Grunice and Gamma appears to go up. It's somewhat surprising, but it's because the, of the distributed coordination change uh, in going from uh, the low pressure to the high pressure behavior, uh, and that causes the Grunice and Gamma to increase. Now, eventually, maybe at extremely high pressures, that will no longer be true. But at least in this pressure range, it leads to a markedly different uh, behavior. So this has to be dealt with. It means, of course, that the estimates for temperature, this is why I like entropy, because otherwise you get into all sorts of entanglements with the temperature. Uh, the temperature estimates for the deep mantle um, magma ocean, in the old work are incorrect, they should be higher because the uh, isentrope is steeper. Dave, can you clarify what anion is? Can you clarify what anion is? So anios is this horrible thing that's been around for a very long time <laughs> that uh, uh, has been used in these types of calculations because it is a uh, it has some physics input, and it's partly parameterized, and it's designed to be anything. So, you know, so people at places like Los Alamos uh, have used this. Uh, I don't like it much, so I don't want to describe it to you. Uh, but it, it is an attempt to come up with a generalized description of, of the thermodynamics of materials over a full range of pressures, including the vapor. There are problems with the vapor as well, which is of interest for understanding the moon. And Jay Malash has played a bit with that. We've played a bit with that. You know, the question of uh, if, if I take a vapor that has <coughs> uh, a certain magnesium to iron ratio, does the vapor have more iron than magnesium or so forth, which may be relevant for understanding the moon. Um, these are questions for which we do not have answers. All that I can tell you is I don't trust any of us on this particular issue, uh, either in this respect or actually in the vapor. So there are, I'm telling you an agenda for the future, in part. These are things that need to be understood better. Uh, of course, for, for the question of the Earth, it may be slightly less relevant, but for understanding the origin of the moon, the vapor part matters. That, that of course, is at low pressure. And then there's also the point of uh, the question of what is the critical temperature, the temperature above which you don't have liquid and, and vapor, but just have a fluid. Was there another question? So uh, I'm going to spend uh, less time on this topic, but I think it's an interesting one because I've discovered that people have uh, possibly uh, false notions about this, and it has come up in connection with mercury, but also in connection with water and the moon. Now, when you have an impact, a large impact, it doesn't have to be a giant impact. It may even go down to tens of kilometers to some extent depends on the details, um, you're creating a transient cavity. And on the walls of that transient cavity, during the impact event, you have strong shear. And the strong shear creates instabilities. There are also, I should say, Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, inertial Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, or Rick Meyer Meshkoff instabilities. So it's a complicated story. But the Kelvin-Helmholtz instabilities will drive 
a, uh, a Kolmogorov style turbulence, meaning that you've got a, a, an energy available that can be put into small scale motions and the scale of that depends on the viscosity of the material but typically what happens for the energy budget that you have is that you can mix down to a very small scale so so I've got a large scale process but I'm making a small scale mixing event uh, locally and of course, if, if I bring in a giant body that has ice, say, uh, everything gets melted through the shock that propagates. And then you've got the shear instability and Rady Taylor instabilities that mix down to small scale. And so the water in contact with the silicates can diffuse because it's on a small scale and in large impact events, uh, there's plenty of time to do that diffusion. And so then subsequently the material quenches, it gets buried, and so there's no difficulty in my opinion in getting volatiles injected into a planet during an impact. Of course, at the same time, you may blast off part of some atmosphere, but both processes will be taking place. If you hit comets on the moon, you might perhaps uh, inject some water. And certainly with large impacts, uh, part of the material, even though it's buoyant, can get mixed down to depth. Before you leave that slide, that, that cartoon there illustrates something that I teach when I teach an introductory planetary class, which is that a large amount of the material from an impact that, is ex that, that, that comes up and creates the creator is actually being excavated from the, impact, the impacting body. Correct. Or, or the impacted body. Yeah, the hole is much bigger than the impacting body. That's especially true for small impacts. Uh, once you get to giant impacts, uh, that difference becomes less. But yes, you're right. You're excavating. You're, you're injecting volatiles into the impacted body, but what's the length scale of that as compared to the, the material that's being excavated and, and blasted right back out into the atmosphere? Uh, of course, a lot of it comes back down onto the surface and, and is buried. Uh, Sarah may have an opinion on this. I was to say that during planet growth, the impact velocities are not much more than escape velocity. Correct. In a typical cratering event, a very small mass fraction that's ejected actually reaches the impact velocity. So a very small yes. mass fraction yes. has escape velocity, and the rest will re-accrete, I mean, land back on the body. And volatiles that are bound, if they are actually turned into the gas phase, will be bound by what atmosphere can be retained on that planet. Yeah, I guess my question is a little bit different, because and maybe specific to my interest. I'm interested in whether what you, what you mean is that the volatiles remain with the body in its atmosphere as opposed to escape, or whether or not the, the volatiles are actually injected into the interior. I think to some extent they're injected, but, but I will confess that I've not quantified this in great detail, so I can't tell you fractions. Something else to be done, right, Sarah? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's not clear that, uh, well, in a giant impact, some of the material never gets released to low pressure. But you're right that if, I mean, this last bit, uh, that raises a whole bunch of other issues because comets do come in at high velocity, so then, then it's not so clear. So I, you know, uh, so this is a somewhat different situation. But, but some of the material need not get released to, to low pressure. But you're right, of course, the water will come back out. If, uh, if, it, if it's, if it's uh, adiabatically released to low pressure. Now let's talk a little about core formation and uh, this has a lot of overlap with the things that Dave Ruby was talking about and he will come back to this next week. And so I'm not going to uh, give as complete a discussion of this perhaps as he will and some of the issues here are not perfectly understood. SPH calculations can't tell you how the core form because they have low resolution. And there are also some peculiarities about what happens in SPH calculations when you've got a mixture of materials. Some aspects of SPH calculations are unreliable when you've got mixtures. Immiscible materials is what we are perhaps talking about here. But when you look at the giant impact 
calculations, what you find is that the secondary impact, like in the simulation I showed, comes crashing in with the core and it sort of looks as if uh, a lot of the core is roughly intact, but maybe uh, in the process of the impact itself, secondary impact, it does break up into large blobs. Maybe even a sheet which penetrates, and I will come back to that in a moment because there's some interesting fluid dynamics there. But let me just make a, a rather obvious point that were you to break the iron down into small droplets or even things the size of baseballs or so, uh, diffusion times can be quite short. So diffusion time, by which I mean diffusion of atoms uh, across a radius of a blob of size R, uh, it can be hours for radii of a few centimeters. The transport time for getting through here, uh, here I'm quoting the high Reynolds number limit, so this is the limit where viscosity doesn't matter. And uh, the velocities in that case go as the square root of the size of the body. Uh, this time scale here is of order a day if you go to a radius of 1,000 kilometers, but it can be, uh, actually, if you do it with the viscosity at low Reynolds number, it can be thousands of years. Dave Ruby will probably talk about that uh, at, a, at radii of, of centimeters. So for large radii, I mean, if you really had blobs like this, and this scale would, would be right, then it would be unequilibrated. Now, this is not a simple problem because there is circulation within the blob as well, but the point is that the amount of material that this comes into contact with as it plunges through the mantle is simply not enough allow, to allow it to equilibrate. So for large blobs, it won't equilibrate. Now, this is a complicated problem because what happens to big blobs like this is, of course, they're not spheres, complicated geometry. They do flatten out, they pancake, they fission, and they fission, roughly speaking, when they fall their own diameter. And what that means is that you need very large blobs for them to plunge through to the core in a short time scale. The way to think about it is this, you start at the top, your blob starts at the top, it goes its own diameter and breaks into two, but then of course, uh, because the diameter is smaller, when it breaks it has gone less distance, and so it's a simple geometric progression from a very large blob to a very large number of small blobs that exponentiates uh, fissioning by a factor of two each time, that's a spectacular rate of breaking up. And so you can actually go from blobs that are hundreds of kilometers across all the way to raindrops very quickly. Now raindrops, like raindrops in the Earth's atmosphere, their properties are of course determined, as Dave Ruby mentioned, uh, by a balance of the hydrodynamic forces and uh, surface tension. So there's a natural uh, end point to this process. If these blobs are very large, they might actually get to the core unequilibrated. It's a close call. Here are the instabilities you have to think about. There is a Rayleigh-Taylor instability at the interface between the iron and the silicate. And if you want to look at the details of that, it's in a paper I wrote with Tice Dale, which was an EPSL a year or two ago. This is an actual experiment and simulation done showing an interesting fact about Rayleigh-Taylor, which is it's very small scale. So you can't pick it up in a fluid dynamical simulation. You really need to do experiments, and then it goes to a Kolmogorov type spectrum and produces an emulsion. Now remember, the iron is immiscible in the, in the silicate, so in the case of that system, it'll be an emulsion. In this case, it happens to be salty water and fresh water, so of course the salt can diffuse. That's one kind of instability, which starts out small and actually grows to produce a Kolmogorov type spectrum. There are also large-scale instabilities, Kelvin Helmholtz, which uh, are illustrated here, classic experiment, very important to oceanographers. Uh, so here you have dense fluid over light fluid, but it's sheared, and you, you produce these uh, swirling instabilities at the interface, which produce eventually an emulsion of the two fluids are not, uh, not miscible, and so you progress to a gradual mixing. Here's a very relevant experiment, classic experiment by Stuart Turner. Um, and what it shows here is a 
uh, a negative plume, if you will. In other words, dense fluid is being dropped into less dense fluid, so this is like the core formation event, not in detail, but sort of like that, uh, in which you suddenly deliver a lot of iron. And what happens is you make a plume, and these instabilities here are producing the spreading of the jet as it goes down, but you'll notice that there isn't complete mixing, and so the, in my opinion, the question of what actually happens uh, during the core formation event may look a bit like this, and for that reason, I'm actually skeptical of some of the work that's currently being done, not yet published, where people say, let's just look at an iron blob and how it fragments and so forth. So I think this is actually not yet a fully understood problem, and it's possible for some of the iron after a giant impact to reach the core without equilibrating. One thing to keep in mind is that in a giant impact, the iron is delivered to the surface of the Earth heterogeneously. That's important in particular for the hafnium tungsten chronology. Imagine that you are uh, a hafnium-182 atom, and you were sitting on the far side of the Earth relative to the impact event and you've decayed into tungsten 182, you're not going to have a chance to get to the core because you're not going to see any iron. You're not going to see the iron from the impact event. So there's a kind of disequilibrium that comes about just from the geometry, independent of the details of whether the iron fragments into small particles. Just a question of whether that material can see the iron as the iron goes to the core. It is, of course, true that the SPH does not resolve the breakup of the iron. Some of it may be in large enough blobs to crash through the molten mantle in a few hours, almost a free fall time. And so the issue here is whether it breaks up in small enough droplets. I think that if the iron arrives in things that are tens of kilometers across, there's no doubt it will fragment all the way to droplets before it gets to the core. Uh, but once you get up to hundreds and certainly thousand or so kilometers, it's no longer clear. So this is, in some sense, a, a, a disturbing issue because it's likely that the answer to this question is contingent on details. You're not going to be able to make a definitive statement about how well you equilibrate. Dave? Yeah. Events, they tend to shear out the core and yeah. deposit it over a much larger surface area. In some cases, that's, Sarah is right. Uh, although in the particular one I showed, it actually sort of comes in as an elongated streamer, but it's still actually sort of localized. So you know, so, so it's coming in like my arm into into the earth. So, and 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 so then it looks like Stuart Turner's uh, inverted plume. And it may not mix. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not claiming I know the answer. But, but, but the, the, the moral of the story is that the way you add the core is very different in different impact. Correct. Factors. Correct. Yeah. How does it have multiple giant impact events? How many, how many giant impact events can you tolerate before you would expect this sort of uniform distribution around the planet? <clears throat> No matter how you add to the core, the individual events are well enough spaced in time that you can treat them as independent events. I mean, and, and I don't know to what extent uh, Dave Ruby is going to talk about time scales, but, but even with the raindrop, which is the slowest process, it's thousands of years. So that's a tiny time. So, so the answer to your question really comes back to what are the specifics of the giant impacts, but you don't have to worry about them interfering with each other. They will be, in effect, independent events. And these droplets, there's, there's, uh, other, the droplets, the size of the droplets is changing the steps, right? And the velocity is sinking. Right? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. So, so you start out with something big that's moving very fast, uh, then fragments into smaller things which move less rapidly. Yeah. And, and so if it starts fragmenting down to small things, 
then it will actually eventually equilibrate. I mean, if you do the arithmetic, it's, it's, right. it's easy to show that because they're slowing down uh, and, and so uh, they go a shorter distance before the next fragmentation. Yes, yes. In fact, I'm sure Dave will say something about that. There's a tendency for it to equilibrate with the deepest part of the magma ocean, whatever that is. Uh, uh, in, the, in the giant impact scenario, I think that will actually extend all the way to the core mantle boundary, which, by the way, is 100 GPA in, in the giant impacts I showed, not 136, because it's all puffed up. And when you puff up an object, the pressures go down. But it's also very high temperature. Now, there is another part to the core formation story, and this is actually what you more often see in the literature. Uh, I don't actually like it that much, even though I was partly responsible for it. Um, <coughs> but it is, to be sure, a picture that might be relevant to, who knows, tens of percent, surely, of the core forming material. Maybe even more, because this is the picture that applies between giant impacts. And there is stuff being delivered between giant impacts. Uh, and in that picture, part of the system will freeze up. Now, this is an old picture, and it's not correct in detail, because the bottommost part of it may be a base or magma ocean. But the essential idea is still correct, that you, with your small impacts, you will get fragmentation. You will go all the way to the droplet size of maybe a centimeter, the number that Dave Ruby mentioned, although that does depend on viscosity, of course, and surface tension, so there's a little bit of uncertainty in that. But it's around about a, a centimeter, and so they will be gently raining down through this convecting system, accumulating somewhere, and then you can use Rayleigh Taylor instabilities. And these, of course, in all likelihood, will not equilibrate with the surrounding material. So in that picture, the equilibration process that uh, is of relevance for understanding the siderophiles will be one that is dictated uh, over some pressure range uh, that corresponds to this uh, partial magma ocean, a magma ocean that does not extend all the way to the core. So giant impacts and small impactors have different consequences. Giant impacts reset the magma ocean. Uh, equilibration is less in those cases. Very high temperatures and pressures may be relevant. Uh, it may affect the hafnium tungsten chronology. It's not clear that you have equilibrium in the last giant impact that made the moon, for example. And of course, we're stuck a little bit with the citrophile story in general because we don't have good data at the highest pressures, although people are starting to get there. And maybe in some average sense, it's 50 GPA. I don't know what the number is. And Dave, I think you'll say something about that. Yeah. Uh, could you go back to that last slide? Yeah. Question. I had a question about the slide before. Yeah. So we have uh, four in droplets. Is the micro ocean in a state of vigorous convection at that stage? Or? Yes. And, and the droplets will, will, if there's a boundary down here, the droplets will get into the boundary and will settle out. So even when it's vigorously convecting, provided there's a solid boundary somewhere, they will still accumulate. Is that yeah. the point? Yeah. Um, Dave, a difference between these two cartoons is the chill press. Should there be one or not? Ah. A difference so, so, yes. <coughs> well, uh, the boundary layer. Uh, I don't think it actually makes a lot of difference to the story. Um, it is, of course, true that a more likely picture is to put an atmosphere up here. Actually, I don't see Bernie's atmosphere. But anyway, <laughs> but it's true that Abiy Matsui uh, proposed long ago, uh, before 89 even, that there could be a steam atmosphere up here. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable idea. And that, of course, will set uh, the amount of water in the magma ocean for, for a given total amount. Um, and, and that limits the rate at which uh, energy can escape. And, and typically, the top of that atmosphere will be radiating at four or 500 Kelvin. So it's not as if it's radiating uh, from a, a naked magma ocean. Uh, and the chill crust 
might not actually be a lot different than that kind of blanketing atmosphere from the point of view of the vigor of convection and the heat flow. But that's a detail uh, that depends on, on the specifics of the model. Uh, fine. So, so if you, sure, I mean, you could imagine an intermediate sequence of cartoons where, where you hit the Earth with something half the size of Mars, which probably won't melt all the way through. And then you, then you have um, more nearly hemispheric melting, and then, as in their story, you have very rapid, what you might call post-glacial rebound. The melt will, will flow out onto the surface and, uh, and so then this interface will go down to some greater depth, and, and so there'll be a range of possible values for that uh, interface. Historical melt uh, on the, will, will that be convecting? Because you, uh, as you said, the will yes. be high near the top, where the impact uh, is less than the so, You mean for something that's less than a Mars sized projectile? Well, Mars so, um, <clears throat> uh, what I showed you earlier, uh, the temperatures at the bottom are actually higher than the temperatures at the top, but the entropy at the bottom is lower, and so it doesn't mix initially. The outer region has to cool, and so the system then gradually evolves towards an 80 bat. I, I know what you're asking, but there's not a simple answer. <laughs> because if the core formation process is happening on 1,000 years, that's a similar time scale to the rate at which the system is relaxing to an 80 bat. So it's not a simple temperature profile. Sorry. <laughs> that's a complicated problem. I would hope we don't have to get into too much of that kind of complication, but maybe eventually we will. Yeah. Yeah, it might, I mean, maybe there's a way of testing that. I don't know the answer. Let's talk a little bit more about magma oceans. Uh, you can, of course, imagine a naked magma ocean, by which I mean a, a magma ocean which has no overlying cap or dense atmosphere to keep it hot. Uh, it'll cool quickly, maybe the earliest stage of the lunar magma ocean. This is well before the flotation of the anorthocytic material. Uh, maybe is like that, although even that one will have some atmosphere, but the atmosphere will be escaping. You can have a, a veiled or blanketed uh, magma ocean, silicate vapor for a short period of time, and then various other things. And this is presumably what the Earth had throughout much of its accretion which means it would not be a, a chill crust. Atmosphere. Sorry? It's an atmosphere. The black is the vapor. It's an atmosphere of gas. Yeah. So water, yeah, I'm sorry. Water here means water vapor. Yeah. <clears throat> and then it can be capped. Maybe uh, you can imagine a scenario where there is a, a stable cap, as with the late stage of the lunar magma ocean, or you can have foundering crust uh, there is an example in our solar system right now which might be a magma ocean. I'm a little skeptical because it may just be partial melt, but we know from the magnetic induction results, um, <coughs> uh, Krishan Karana, that Io may actually have such a state that is a capped magma ocean right now. Of course, that's a special case because of tidal heating. But keep in mind that in some sense, things like Europa's ocean or even the Earth's outer core are really magma oceans. You can have an ocean underneath an ice shell, and we think, by the way, that that's also true for Ganymede, Callisto, and now Titan, uh, because, of course, uh, the solid that forms from it can float. That's not true uh, for all pressure ranges for silicates, of course. In fact, in, in many instances, the solids that form will sink rather than float. But conceptually, these are magma oceans, and they can persist.
for a very long time. You can also have a magma ocean in the UF transition zone or above the core mantle boundary, and, and they can exist for a very long time. So you have to keep in mind that in this problem we have some things that are very short time scale and some things that are very long time scale, just depending on the physical conditions. So as I said, we think that giant impact will melt the entire mantle, allow for efficient core formation, but it also cools very fast. And by the way, that means that you could already have a water ocean on the surface of the Earth in perhaps a few million years, maybe a bit longer because of tidal heating from the receding moon. But, but anyway, geologically speaking, this is a short time scale. Uh, intermediate sized bodies can create transient magma oceans, that's the Tonks and Malash story, or add to an existing magma ocean. And of course, if I'm just raining in solid objects, I get what is effect, what is like a greenhouse effect. But of course, in the standard greenhouse story, it's sunlight that's penetrating through the atmosphere, providing energy that then has to escape by infrared and has trouble getting out. Uh, in this story, it's accretional energy, not sunlight, that's adding energy at the base. And provided the flux exceeds some critical value, this is a way of sustaining a steam atmosphere. And this is the Abi and Matsui story, but keep in mind that that atmosphere will collapse once the accretion stops and may even have collapsed between giant impacts. But a partially molten state can persist for a long time. Here are some time scales. So if you, if you attribute uh, to the magma ocean a depth D, a temperature T, and it's radiating at some effect of temperature, and ask how long does it take to cool by 10%, uh, here's the answer, 300 years of the temperature is 2,000 Kelvin, the depth is 1,000 kilometers, and it's radiating at 1,000 Kelvin. So you can see these are short time scales. Contrast that with a capped magma ocean. In that case, of course, you have the Stepan problem, the classic problem of what happens. Uh, you know, this is why, uh, in some sense, you can argue that life on Earth depends on the fact that water, ice, uh, ice derived from water floats. Uh, if, if water were a conventional material rather than the strange material it is, uh, we would not have life. Um, so the Stepan problem says that you get this insulating effect. And of course, now you've got very long time scales, uh, even for a modest thickness of cap. And so that, of course, is why uh, you may have very long time scales associated with the final stages of the lunar magma ocean or any magma ocean in the Earth, such as one that people think might happen in the transition zone. <clears throat> what matters is the uh, density properties, but also the related thing of the, the slope of the solidus. For example, in the transition zone, uh, the melting curve tends to turn over and the 80 bat may be steeper than the melting curve and so you can have a melt in the transition zone that exists for a long time. Same thing can happen at the base of the mantle. Uh, foundering crust models, chill crust if you will, often uh, if, if you're guided by what happens at Kilauea on the Earth, for example, um, the effective temperature is a few hundred degrees, so the time scales are longer, but they're not geologically long. So foundering crust uh, reduces the rate at which heat is lost, but it doesn't shift you from this to this. It gives you something that's closer to a magma ocean for cooling rates. <clears throat> and of course, then comes the question of differentiation in the mantle. And, uh, Slava Solomadov and I looked at this a long time ago, and, and we still think that an important thing to understand in this problem is that contrary to the intuition that many geologists have, you don't necessarily differentiate in an early phase of a magma ocean even as you crystallize. And the reason is that the crystals are transported vigorously by the convection and for a wide range of pressures that will exist in the planet, you're going to take these crystals and remelt them as they carried up and then reform them as they go down. So this is a complicated dynamic. However, and this is important, once you get into the percolative regime where the crystals are touching each other and forming an interconnected network, uh, high viscosity system, 
in the bulk sense, but the liquid in between the crystals is low viscosity, then of course you can get percolation either up or down. And I don't know of any reasonable choice of parameters for which this entire system will stay well mixed. You can have a subsequent turnover, as in Lindy Elkintanton's models, but this is a certainly a way of producing, for example, basal magma ocean if it's iron rich, or <coughs> uh, uh, differentiating in either direction. And this may be of some relevance uh, to the need in the 142 story. Um, and I showed this before, but the basic idea, of course, is that you ha if you have this convecting system, then the, the crystals get transported up, they remelt, they have to reform. And so the dynamic here is a competition between Oswald ripening and the rate at which the crystals are carried around. Of course, if they get to be really big, they will settle out. So this is uh, a good example of something, I think Mark talked about this that came up earlier, uh, that this is an area where we need better understanding of uh, the uh, diffusion properties that go into determining the rate at which uh, crystals grow. And, and that, of course, is going to be quite sensitive to composition. Those, those crystals you show at the bottom, they might be uh, verging upwards, uh, depending on the density, relationship. Right. Uh, of course, you know, in the context of comparing Earth and Moon, the story is whether you get into the Garnet field and, and uh, you know, so whether you can flotate uh, crystals. But yes, and that, that, so the phase diagram matters and the pressure range over which you're doing this differentiation matters. <coughs> uh, so a, what's the main point here? Main point is don't use the intuition that comes to you from looking at layered intrusions or any small scale geologic process uh, because of two things. Number one, the bigger of the convection can be orders of magnitude higher in the early Earth than in your magma chamber uh, uh, analog that you're looking at in the geologic record on Earth. And uh, second point, when you get to very large scale magma oceans, pressure matters a lot. And so the behavior of the phases at the top will be different from those at the bottom. And so again, your intuition that comes from magma chambers will be wrong. And of course, you're going to have to worry about exactly where the liquidus is and where the solidus is and where the adipad is and what their relative slopes are. Uh, Lindy Elkins Tandon has taken the simple approach of just separating things out according to density. I don't know whether it's right, but, but I, I give her credit for trying. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, possibility that you could get something like this uh, which might subsequently be unstable because when you look at the phases when it freezes out you can have a region that is uh, more dense near the surface and then the whole thing can overturn. I don't know whether that's right but that's uh, <clears throat> obviously uh, part of the question of whether you get mixing. Yes? Uh, just a small point, but for mineralogy, there's some rather shocking things written on here, like beta olivine and gamma olivine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yes. Not the structure. Well, you know. <laughs> right. So, um, so, so Lindy has uh, taken on a very difficult task here of getting everything right at once, you know, getting the fluid dynamics right, getting the densities right, getting the phase diagram right, and so forth. And so she gets attacked from all sides, right? <laughs> <coughs> That's what happens when you try and do it interdisciplinary way. What is probably true, and, and this goes back actually to what I said about Lars Stickford's work, although it's supported by the shockwave work, is that it does seem likely that the isentrope uh, near the base of the mantle is steeper than the liquidus. 
And so that means quite aside from the question of compositional differences that you're likely or you could have a, uh, a basal magma ocean. Um, my point is that this can form even before the giant impact, can, but also liquid could percolate down to this region if it's iron rich. So this is, this is something that could in principle persist for a long time. I don't think it's there now. I don't think seismically you have it. You have an ultra low velocity zone. I think it's a little bit of a stretch, frankly, to say that that's the end of the basal magma ocean. It means we're living at a special time. But it's certainly possible just because of the uh, temperature profile near the core mantle boundary that you happen to be close to the uh, solidus right now. Uh, I could give a whole other talk about core mantle interactions, but I won't because I'm running out of time. <clears throat> so, so there are two ways to have a very long-lived magma ocean. You can have a flotation crust. This can explain why, on the one hand, we think that the events that went into making the moon are uh, confined to a short period of time, but the history of the early moon can be spread out over uh, potentially hundreds of millions of years. Um, but you can also, of course, have a crossover at the eddy bat and the solidus liquidus, uh, the, the, the solidus or liquidus uh, gradients, melting curve, broadly speaking. Um, and that, too, can allow you to have a liquid layer which, of course, is why we have a magma ocean that is, to, to say, a conventional ocean in, that, in Europa. I don't think you can get out of this uh, so easy with the flotation crust. And one of the issues with this is in, in the moon, the argument has always been that there's a certain type of anorthosite. It's called the ferro anorthosite. There are the flotation crusts from the lunar magma ocean. That had to form fairly quick because this, up until that point, it was a capitalist magma ocean. Yeah. So those rocks if they are indeed the first precipitates out of the magma ocean, had to form fairly quickly within yes. a million years. You're right. Years. Some of it has to, be, has to form quickly. So if you're yes. talking about the Borg, it all results in 4.36 billion years old for, for a fair north of that. So if that's truly a magma ocean location cumulus, and that age dates it, the magma ocean can't be a lot older than that. The only way out is to have that be a remobilized secondary crust melt, you know, a, a later Yeah, history. fair enough. Yeah, I... I you're right. I, I, I should say that, in my opinion, the simple picture of flotation is unlikely to be right. I think it's more complicated. But, but the point you're making is, is a valid one. I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> so the point is that uh, the very first flotation of a North Pacific crust has to happen very early on. And that's not going to explain these much later ages. Is that good enough? Like 4.36. I mean, it should happen. It should. Yeah, yeah, I understand. It's not for you. It's not for Mike Manger. It's for the computer. The computer is more important, right? <laughs> so do magma oceans lead to a differentiated state? Not in the vigorous early stage, despite crystallization. Uh, yes, when you enter the percolative regime, maybe this will evolve to an unstable state that produces large-scale mixing. I don't think we have enough information at the moment to decide that. Dave, before we leave that one. <laughs> part of the issue, you know, part of the reason we're talking about magma oceans is we went to the moon and, and we have samples from Mars. And Mars is a great example where we do know that it probably underwent a magma ocean very early. And that record has been preserved till the 150 million year ages of the sugar type. So there's an example where, it, you know, okay, it's not the size of the Earth, but it clearly underwent very early differentiation that was preserved throughout the history that created very uh, composition of the same layers within, within Mars. Yeah. So we have examples of differentiated planets. Yes. Briefly, I want to address this counterintuitive point, which I think is of relevance. Consider this system. I've got a stably stratified system, lower density above higher density, and both regions are convecting. 
and consider the corresponding system, same density difference, but I've got two liquids. Suppose for the moment they're admissible, although that's not crucial for the main point. Here's the point. The solid has high viscosity, and that means that the density variations associated with the convection are much larger over here than over here. I should remind you that the usual estimates of temperature fluctuations that are associated with low viscosity convection can be down in the millikelvin range. Very, very small temperature variations, like the Earth's outer core. Don't know for sure what those numbers are, but they may be millikelvin. They're tiny. And also, because the material has low viscosity, there's not much shear stress being exerted associated with these flows. And so what happens in this case depends, of course, on the details of the parameters. But what can happen in this case is that you can entrain material from this region into this region because of the convective shear stresses near the interface. And of course, this has been known for a long time. This is implicit in people's ideas about how you may entrain material from uh, uh, regions near the core mantle boundary into plumes, all of that material being perhaps solid. Uh, and the entrainment rate depends on the details of the viscosity contrast and the, uh, how big this is compared with alpha delta t and so forth. But the point is it can happen over here. It will not, in general, for realistic parameter values. If the system allows for diffusion, that is, if they're partly immiscible, then, of course, you can get double diffusive convection material going into here, and then you'll get a complicated outcome. But the net effect in that case uh, is still one where the region up here uh, doesn't know about the region down here, whereas in this case you can carry material high up. Uh, now, mixing in the context of solids is not mixing down to the grain scale, it's mixing down to some scale which upon sampling by partial melting leads to uh, a, a sample of material that came from the lower layer. So that's my story that in that this one, which can be relevant, for example, to immediately after the giant impact, means that if I had a basal magma ocean, it need not get mixed up. If the system was solid, you would actually get more mixing. Uh, this is just about my last slide. So why are some things so poorly understood? Well, I think you can, if you've been paying attention, from previous presentations and also from this one, you can see that material properties matter a lot. And so there really is a challenge here. And, and the challenge is to the mineral physicists. And uh, I'm using that term in the broad sense to include, of course, things like measuring partition coefficients under extreme conditions. Extreme includes the very extreme conditions of giant impacts, but also the lower mantle. And so we have a long way to go still to really have all of the information that we need. And that is a significant part of the difficulty that we are confronting at the moment, that we don't really know the phase diagrams well enough for the deep mantle, for example but also things like the kinetics, the growth of grains, and so forth. In the context of some of the things that I've been talking about here, one of the difficulties is that numerical codes, such as SPH, are unable to tackle many of the questions that arise because those questions have to do with multiple scales. You have the large scale, planet scale processes, you have the mesoscale processes, things that are at the tens to hundreds of kilometers, which is below reasonable SPH. And you have scales all the way down to centimeters. And, and of course, uh, nobody in their right mind is thinking that you would do this with some giant computer simulation. It's simply not a realistic thing to do for a high Reynolds number system. Clearly, the way forward is to divide and conquer. And Implicitly, that's what people are doing. Divide and conquer means in this context that you're taking your large scale problem and your small scale problem and patching between the two, but treating them by separate codes. And so you understand the emulsification that is relevant to core formation as a separate problem from the large scale problem of the giant impact. <clears throat> 
My final point is a little bit more philosophical, but I think it is important. Stepping back from the specifics I talked about and thinking about the problem of how to understand why the Earth is the way it is and why the solar system is the way it is, you have to keep in mind that um, we're looking at the outcome of an irreversible process. And it's entirely possible that some aspects of that are not preserved in anything that we can measure. Let me give you an analogy. Suppose I give you a uh, glass of water and I ask you to tell me whether the water in that glass was at one point in the form of ice. Now, if it's an open system, you may be able to answer that question from isotopes, for example, because the vapor will have a different isotopic character from the liquid. But in a closed system, you have no way of telling me whether the water in that tumbler, in that container, was once vapor or once ice or was always water. It's an unanswerable question, unless you believe in homeopathy. Because <clears throat> they, of course, think that water molecules have memory. Uh, but uh, so now, of course, there are things from the interstellar medium. Rick Carlson mentioned us, you know, uh, uh, small particles that survive and so forth. So, so obviously, geochemistry is very powerful in this area. But you have to keep in mind that it's not all powerful. That is, you can't imagine. Uh, I can't imagine how I'm going to use geochemistry in the broadest sense to, to tell me whether Jupiter was once at three astronomical units rather than five and things like that. So you have to keep in mind that uh, the, the particular non-unique way in which the solar system reached its observed state uh, might not actually be recoverable. And that's it. Yeah. What, what do you imagine the water cycle is like during the period? Is it preferentially stored as vapor, or how much can be dissolved in, in the magma ocean? I, I'm sorry. Which the, the water cycle? The water. Oh. Well, <laughs> maybe Mark can answer. Oh, of course, there is, there is a standard story about uh, coming just from Henry's law about how much water you put in the magma ocean. And if, you, if you've got a, a coexisting atmosphere of um, a couple of hundred bars, then you can have roughly as much water in that ocean as in the atmosphere. So if you came along with a giant impact and blasted away the atmosphere, the atmosphere would have happily come back, you know, <laughs> by Henry's law, uh, roughly speaking, which is why I'm very skeptical of notions that giant impacts or any kind of impact are a way of getting rid of atmospheres, at least in that epoch. But in, in, a, in a more um, complete way, uh, now, now, the other thing that matters, of course, in that context is whether you're also forming a core at the same time because you can actually take some hydrogen, which is derived from the water, and put it into the core. There's a lot of interesting questions there which are better addressed at the guy immediately in front of you. Yeah? On your mixing with liquid-liquid and solid-solid, can you comment on how the vigor of convection affects your statement on the mixing? the number of overturns per unit time? Uh, in, in the case where the density difference between the two regions is, say, a few percent, and I've got immiscible fluids, the low viscosity case, there will be essentially no mixing, no matter how vigorous. And the reason is that the convecting, convection scaling laws for convection tell you that uh, you still have only tiny density differences within a convecting layer, uh, even when the convection is like a meter per second. It's not going to matter whether it's a meter per second or a centimeter per second. It's just not going to be enough. You have waves at the interface. And, maybe, and, and I suppose if you, if you go to very vigorous convection, you can get a breaking surf, you know, like out there. Uh, so that's a complicated question. Now, now the other case of... Uh, uh, entrainment across solid-solid interface. Uh, 
I can't off the top of my head give you a detailed quantitative answer, but it has been studied. You know, people like Norm Sleep and others and the numerical simulations, you know, Xi Zhang and various other people here have done, uh, uh, Louise Kellogg, have done numerical simulations of, of entrainment rates. But there's, there's no simple answer to your question. In that case, it depends on the viscosity contrast and the ratio of the thermal buoyancy to the compositional buoyancy and so forth. Rick? So given the process that you described, can, can you like, pick your favorite one to explain why Mars preserves such obvious evidence of an early mag motion in the Earth? We, you know, we have to search for chemical evidence for a mag motion in the Earth. So I mean, the preservation is very different. Yes. It is possible, of course, that Mars never had a giant impact. So that may be relevant. It's also true, of course, that the pressure range on Mars only marginally gets you into the perovskite field. So those are the two things that immediately come to my mind. Uh, the general energy budget for Mars is not anywhere near as big as for the Earth. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so that, that could be part of the story in a more general sense. But you're asking the right question. I don't have a uh, sharp answer. I'm only throwing out possibilities. Well, it looks like it's lunchtime.